Conrad Close has come under a lot of attention over the past six months. The decision to go ahead with the Home for Juvenile Offenders was finalised today when opposing residents met with Mr Anderson in their last effort to stop the scheme. Although the decision will not be reversed, a compromise was reached. What I've indicated is that uh, I propose to establish a complaints committee upon which the residents will be represented and that, uh, that the cottage should be allowed to commence uh, operation with that committee in place and that at the end of three months I'll review it and then I've undertaken to come back and meet with them four months after the cottage commences. Well, in order for the cottage to succeed, one of the priorities is that it must have community support. If the neighbourhood doesn't want them there, how can the scheme work? Well, I think you would find that most neighbourhoods would have the sort of reaction that the Charlestown people have had to the concept. But what we want to do is to get them up and operating as we want them to operate. And I think then that many of uh, the perceived fears of the community at the present time will be overcome. Spokesman for the yes, Residents Action Group, John Cooper, says that although they expected the more, they will accept the compromise. Have we been given any hope that he might back down? Well, the Minister said that the cottage was under review, so to that end I think we, we probably were justified in expecting a little bit more. Given that the Minister's only had the portfolio for three weeks, I think it is the best that we could expect. At the end of the three months period, that he might back we will down. then well, renegotiate the with Mr Anderson. Mr Anderson, Mr Anderson has promised us that if our complaints are justified, the house will no longer be used for juvenile offenders. The 28 year old Riffs, his fight began when he was paralysed in both legs at the age of 15. But as a lover of sport, it didn't stop him from becoming the first graduate in physical education of the University of British Columbia and being named Canadian Athlete of the Year in 1983. Rick's World Tour, which spans 34 countries, is raising funds for spinal cord and medical research and rehabilitation. Australia is his halfway mark in what he describes as a challenge of a lifetime. Rick hopes to end the gruelling journey when he wheels into Vancouver in October this year. Our news camera caught up with the marathon wheeler on his way to a civic reception in Newcastle late this afternoon. What keeps you going? What's that motivational force behind you? It's just a pure belief in what I'm doing. I really believe in the people that I'm trying to help. I know there's a need and uh, I'll just give everything I can to complete this tour and to have an impact. Have you ever felt like giving up? <laughs> there's been times when I've felt uh, beaten down, physically uh, exhausted, injured. Uh, and not knowing how much further I could continue, but never ever have I ever wanted to give up. I know that as long as I can pick my arms up again and put them down one more time, that I'll continue to uh, give it everything I've got. So you're going to make it to the end? No doubt about it. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, I'm Janelle Provost. Security around the Queen and Prince Philip has been tightened following an Interpol warning that the IRA may strike during the couple's Australian tour. One man has been arrested over the expected assassination attempt and police are on the alert for people in the teenage to 45 years age bracket on short-term visas from Ireland. Meanwhile, the royal couple has arrived in Adelaide to help the state celebrate its 150th anniversary. In the United States, NASA's chief astronaut John Young launched a scathing attack against NASA officials, saying that they were more concerned about keeping to the schedule of the shuttle program than the safety of those involved. He sent a list of problems in previous shuttle missions to officials, saying that the list proves that there are some very lucky people around NASA. Meanwhile, in other world news, the Philippine government is reported to have placed 13 generals under house arrest because they're believed to be Marcos loyalists. Sources say it's feared the generals may become rallying figures for opposition to the new government of President Cory Aquino. Meanwhile, in South Africa, police have fired tear gas into a crowd of mourners at a funeral in the black township of Soweto. Police say the action was taken because of rioters, but eyewitnesses say the police moved in after a hearse broke down. Several people were injured while fleeing the scene. The incident comes just one day after the government lifted a state of emergency. 
in Austria claims that former United Nations chief Kurt Waldheim was a member of the Hitler Youth Movement may have helped his prospects in the presidential election to be held in May. A recent poll shows that Waldheim's popularity has risen to 42% and his supporters say this is a voter rebellion against the smear campaign. And now to the weather. A cloudy day with some showers mainly along the coast. Slight to moderate seas on a low to moderate swell. Newcastle can expect a top temperature of 23 degrees and 25 for Scone. We'll have details on these and more stories tonight on NBN News at 6. Everybody had a go and came up smiling. The Special Olympics has become an important part of the lives of many intellectually handicapped people. Newcastle has been extensively involved in the development of the organisation. The first pilot program was held here in 1981. The aim of the organisation is to use sport to aid the intellectual and physical development of the competitors. First of all, the fitness idea and the child starts to lose weight and the conditioning, particularly with training, most of them have trained for today. And the second thing is it's the self-image, the idea of winning and just for a moment, they have a moment of glory and this seems to stick with them and carries across to their normal and everyday life. festival would not be complete without an abundance of that seafood. And to that end, one of the highlights of the weekend was the World Prawn Eating Championships. Three heats of eight people sat down to a kilo of prawns, their object to down them in as fast a time as possible. Gone were the social graces, as contestants battled to pick the world record of 7 minutes and 45 seconds. While some contestants bit off more than they could chew, Reigning champion and world record holder Fred Monk of Saltash downed his quota in 5 minutes 42.3 seconds, more than a minute faster than his closest rival. For the second year in a row, Frank has secured a spot in the Guinness Book of Records as the fastest corn eater in the world. Festivities continued yesterday with a change of pace for the traditional Mungo Cup oyster punt race. Nine vessels floundered down the Mile River before a large crowd of locals and visitors. With sabotage a top priority, crews threw every missile imaginable in a bid to down the opposition. The boat crewed by NBN personalities proved a popular target, as pirates tossed flour, fish and prawns at the hapless paddlers. Although competition was intense, the pump powered by the Tea Garden Swimming Club secured the dubious honour of floating home first. supported him and uh, we gave him mouth to mouth. On the beach, paramedics worked on the man for about half an hour, trying to evade and stabilise him. The 23-year-old American was taken direct to the intensive care unit of the Royal Newcastle Hospital, but was dead on arrival. 
Police are withholding the man's name until relatives have been informed. According to an RAAS spokesman who has been in Australia for only a few weeks, working as a computer consultant at the Williamtown base. A Newcastle doctor says he's being intimidated into leaving his after-hours clinic by a group of businessmen and doctors who want to set up a 24-hour medical surgery. Dr David Parker has taken out a summons against the men who believes are responsible for making these threats and throwing a brick through the surgery window last month just to prove their point. Join Ray Deneen and Anna Manzoni for all the news tonight at 6. The five seminars, which also address the problems of homeless youth, taking young people out of institutions, single parents and sexual abuse, are being organised by the Department of Community Programs at Newcastle University. A spokesperson for the university, Margaret Henry, says that the seminars will be aimed at finding solutions. We hope it won't be a talk fest. We are bringing together a number of professionals who uh, deal with these problems on a day-to-day -day basis, but we're very keen to have young people um, who've experienced these problems or know of people who've experienced these problems, uh, we're very keen for them to come along and join in the discussions and the emphasis will be on producing strategies and solutions. Reverend Tanner couldn't have a more appropriate background for his position as the head of the Uniting Church in this country. His mother was the daughter of a Methodist minister and his father was a Presbyterian elder. From that you may think Reverend Tanner's views would be very much in line with the traditional mainstream. But he's regarded by many as a free thinker. Today he addressed the annual rally of the Hunter Presbytery held at the Adamstown Uniting Church. He was calling for the various denominations of Christianity to work together more and place less emphasis on the divisions. He sees churchgoers getting old and is promoting campaigns to attract young people. And in line with his idea that Christians look at the whole of life and not just their church group, he thinks every Christian should be involved in politics, arguing that politics is the heritage of the Bible. The development will take up the entire dark site, as well as a small portion of council land that was designated for road widening. The three buildings will have a combined floor space of 12,500 square metres, and they'll be surrounded by landscaped gardens. The town planner, Gary Fielding, says that while the redevelopment problems on the site appear to be surmountable, they must nonetheless be addressed. The administration says the developer, Aldo Properties, must provide an additional 85 off-site car parking spaces. It was suggested that the developer approach nearby Harbour Park parking station and secure a written agreement or make a suitable contribution to the administration's car parking fund. The administration says the developer's plan to have a Flags of All Nations display out the front of the buildings will provide a gateway to incoming ships and is in keeping with the administration's Harbour Foreshore concept. A record year for the State Rail Authority in the Newcastle Hunter region, with gross revenue expected to be up by more than 20%. The Hunter region is leading the way in the state, and consequently more money is being allocated to improve rail services locally. Join Ray Deneen and Anna Manzoni for all the news tonight at 6.
increased coal and wheat shipments from the valley to Newcastle have played a major part in the revenue increase. Freight haulage is expected to reach 32.8 million tonnes this financial year, up 16 per cent on last year. However, it's been the increase in passenger business since the 1984 electrification program, which has fostered the greatest growth. After a 55 per cent increase in the 1984-85 year, passenger business has increased by a further 25 per cent, and the SRA's chief executive, David Hills, is delighted. He says the hunter the the is state. leading the state. Uh, certainly from an operating point of view and a revenue point of view, it's by far the best area of the state. It's got to the stage now where Newcastle and the Hunter would be responsible for about a third of the total earnings of the railway's money. David Hill visited the state dockyard during a whistle stop tour of Newcastle today to inspect progress on the establishment of the 1 steam engine and to try and solve an unusual problem. The growth in SRA business has meant increased jobs and many of the apprentices working on the 3801 have been absorbed into the regular SRA workforce putting the restoration program slightly behind schedule. Still, he's determined that it will be completed and on time. The increase in rail traffic and use, while bringing in extra revenue, is also straining existing rail facilities. And Mr Hill says another $60 million is to be spent on the continued upgrading of the Hunters Rail Network, with the prospect of even more growth in the in relation to the coal business, we've already given concessions to the coal proprietors because they're more efficient in the way that they load the coal, which makes us more efficient at the speed with which we can unload it. And we've already given concessions, and as we can keep improving efficiency, yes, we hope to pass on those improvements in efficiency to our customers. The visit by the Royal Thai Air Force contingent has so far taken in Canberra, Melbourne and today Williamtown. The Thai Air Force at the moment has the North Top F5Es. A year ago signed a contract for 12 General Dynamics F16s, the fighter that Australia decided against. During his visit to Williamtown today, Air Chief Marshal Prapan was reluctant to speak about the function of their new F-16 aircraft in relation to Thailand's continuing border skirmishes. However, he said the new aircraft would fulfil their purpose, the defence of Thailand. Air Chief Marshal Prapan showed particular interest in the RAAS latest acquisition, the Hornet, and spoke warmly of the relationship between the Thai and Australian Air Forces. Our two Air Forces have enjoyed a good uh, friendship for many years. So my visit to uh, Australian Air Force this time just to enhance those relationships and good association. Along with the other staff officers, he also showed particular interest in the display of John Van Lappert and Mark Minsky in the F-18 Hornet. The Royal Thai Air Force visitors will leave for Sydney tomorrow, the last the tour before returning to Thailand. Gone are the days when army reservists can be dismissed as weekend warriors. A lot of time and money now goes into training these men and women to perform like professional soldiers. As part of that training, two weeks of war games are being fought in the Narong, Kalua and Bulabila state forests. Yesterday the focus was on air maneuvers, using Air Force Iroquois and Chinook helicopters. 300 reservists from as far away as Mulumba and the Park entered into the spirit of the mock battle. Why do they do it? Get the excitement about it. You know, you meet all your mates, find good buddies in it. You know, the main thing about it, what you, you know, get the, get the adrenaline pump and when you're out in the bush talking, it's good. The Australians are not alone in the bush. 50 Army Reserve GIs from Hawaii have helped spice up the manoeuvres with their antics. Over the next four days, the exercises will continue with mock combat, testing skills in weaponry, strategy and camouflage. 